Well, welcome all you wiretappers out there back here in the studio, Gangland Wire. And I have a guy who I know a lot of you Chicago guys have been wanting to, for me to bring back. Uh, almost tripped over my words there. Surprised that I would do that. Anyhow, you want me to bring back Jay Casenza, right? Is that is that what we call you, Casenza, or is that Costanza, like George Costanza? <laughs> uh, Cosenza, you get that from my 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 mother, my grandfather's name. All right, he is a guy. James is a guy who went to all the mob trials in Chicago, and in in the first show that I did with him, he described in great detail and colorful detail and gave some valuable, great insights into the Family Secrets trial. So he's told me that he's done several other trials. And, you know, I, I interviewed that ATF agent, Lou Velos, who was sent to Chicago because of a bombing that was suspected, uh, was orchestrated by the large guy, Mike Sarno. And he started worming his way in with that crew by, of all things, he had a dentist who saved teeth that had gold in them. So here he is, Lou Velos is this big, tough looking, mixed martial art biker type. He goes into Mark Poltron, who, has, uh, who is one of Sarno's crew members and he has a pawn shop and also is interested in mixed martial arts fighting. And he takes those teeth with the gold in them and says, here, what do you give me for these? And, and Lou said that that this Mark Poulton was, was pretty uh, impressed with the teeth. And he thought, ooh, this is a bad dude. And they became friends and started training together at that local gym there. I mean, did Poulton have a gym? I can't remember, but it was something along those lines. And so he started working his way in. And, and James got to see him testify in the large guy Mike Sarno trial and Poulton was a uh, was a defendant in this too and a little bit about the large guy he's you know long time old school career outfit guy from Cicero and all this stuff happened in and around Cicero you know in the heart of it where it all began and when Jimmy Marcello was convicted in the family secrets trial the large guy or Big Mike, he was able to inherit and take over the video gaming racket in the Chicago area. Now, I don't know if you guys realize how lucrative that is. Uh, James, I just, just an hour ago, I was on the phone to a guy who is, I would say an associate of the Pittsburgh family. And, and we were talking about some of the ways, more modern ways that the mob has learned to make money. And, and he said, video poker, uh, is huge in, in Pittsburgh and it's huge all over the United States. Anywhere where it's illegal and the big companies haven't got into it, then the mob's into it. He said, anytime you see a video poker machine, more than likely it's gonna be a mob connected guy or somebody that's kicking up the mob that, that owns that machine. And, and they're all over. And, and he said, even in a little out of the way dump out in the country in a little you know convenience store, two pump gas station, in a small town said they'll make a grand a week or they'll take in a grand a week and that's a 60 40 split so having all these machines in chicago would be unreal unbelievable amount of money coming in now he probably has to share that around a little bit but still that's a lot of cash money coming in every week a lot of connections out in the community and all the bars and, and corner stores and and so those people all become, in effect, your associates. If you need to know something about a neighborhood or know something about somebody uh, that goes into a bar or, or a corner store that has one of those, just reach out to your guy that's got the machine and, and you know, he's your intelligence guy. He'll be gathering all kinds of information for you. So there's a, a lot of success that you can have by having a string of video pokers. We had them in, we got them in Kansas City and around in the area still because it's not legal in Missouri. Uh, so uh, having said all that, that kind of sets up the, this indictment for Mike, the large guy, Sarno, a racketeering indictment, I think like 40 some counts and, and several other people. This Mark Polchin was one of them and Lou Velos testified. So, so James set us up 
on, you know, what, when you walked into that courtroom, kind of what did you first see? Well, thanks for having me get back, Gary, on your show. I really appreciate it. When I first heard about uh, Big Mike, Mike Sarno's trial, initially I really wasn't that interested because I didn't really know a lot of the players. I mean, I heard of Mike, Mike before, but wasn't familiar with uh, any of the other defendants. And, you know, I was kind of spoiled for many years, as you mentioned in your intro, you know, I attended uh, some of the largest trials in Chicago. However, um, luckily I did attend this trial and I'm so glad that I went to this trial. It, it turned out to be one of my favorites. A uh, couple interesting things about the Mike Sarno trial, it showed the outfit's connection with the outlaw motorcycle game. So Mike Sarno um, grew up um, under the tutelage of Bobby Salerno. I also went to Bobby Salerno's trial that we could talk about at a later date. Bobby Salerno was a, was a heavyweight uh, from the Rocco and Felice crew. So he kind of took Mike Sarno under his wing, if you will. Fast forward. Um, Mike Sarno, you know, a, a made guy of the Chicago outfit. He took over the lucrative video gaming poker business uh, after Jimmy Marcello uh, was indicted in family secret trial. So you had Mike Sarno on trial. The government basically alleged that he was the leader of this crew. Now, when you see Mike Sarno in court, if you were filming a mob, if you were casting for a mob boss, you would pick Mike Sarno. He's three, 350 pounds, and he just looks the part of a, of a mob guy, right? Um, Mike Sarno was out on bond during this trial. So he was uh, able to come and go, and you could actually make small talk with Mike. Oh, really? Yeah. Now... Another defendant, most of the, the, most of the evidence was against Mark Polchman. Mark Polchman was a high-ranking member of the Chicago Outlaw Motorcycle Gang. He basically, if you, if you looked at him, he did not look like a motorcycle guy. He, he looked like an attorney or your neighbor. Clean cut, somewhat of a handsome guy. However... He was a, um, the leader of a, a burglary crew, and not just any burglary crew, but a very sophisticated burglary crew. Him and his uh, defendants were doing jewelry stores, small businesses, and home invasions, not only in Chicago, Gary, but into the entire Midwest. Mm. Mark Polchman was also known as a master safe cracker. If you had a safe, any type of safe oh, really? that had to be peeled or broken into, he was a master at that. Just give him some time and he'd be able to op open that safe. Mark Polk Polkman also operated a, a front called Goldberg Jewelers right in the town of Cicero on Roosevelt and Cicero Avenue. So they used Goldberg Jewelers as a fencing operation for the burglary crew. Um, now, another defendant, two of the defendants were father and son. Another father and son duel. You had Sam Volpendenzo, who was a World War II U.S. Navy war hero. This guy was uh, an associate of the outfit for, for many, many years. I don't remember his age, but he was definitely up there in age, late 70s, early 80s. With him, with Sam Pendenzo, they called him the master blaster. They had him on tape. He got caught on a wire. Number one, he was complaining about Large's crew, how he did all this work for them and they weren't paying him. So he's on tape. You could clearly hear him talking smack about Big Mike and the crew. He also went on to say how prior 
the North Side crew wanted Sam on their crew because, quote, they knew he wasn't a beefer. Fast forward, they got him on tape talking, telling stories about Tony Arcardo. Now, there's not a whole lot of small talk stories about Tony Arcardo, right? He's also on tape talking about his experiences with Mad Sam DeStefano. Wow. Telling on tape, telling the informant some of the things he witnessed being in Mad Sam's presence. Now, fast forward. The reason Sam Bolpendenzo was on trial, he was on tape, Gary, bragging about the bomb that this crew made to blow up a competitor in Berwyn. He was literally bragging on the on the bomb, how he made it. He brags that he put in two wicks. Hmm. So when you ignite both wicks, if one of them is a dud and fizzles out and he slammed his fist on the table and he says, you're goddamn sure the second wick is going to ignite. <laughs> so they basically have him on tape bragging about the bomb he made. Now, this character, mostly most defendants in trials, as you know, they're on their best behavior. They wear a suit, a tie, a nice sweater. You know, they want to make a good appearance in front of the jury. That kind of goes a long way. This guy, the master blaster, he didn't care. <laughs> he came out in court every day. He was in custody in an orange prison jumpsuit in a wheelchair. <laughs> yeah, because he could have changed into civilian clothes if he's a defendant. He didn't Absolutely. have to come in. Yeah, he didn't care. He wore the orange prison jumpsuit, was pretty much laughing and making wisecracks throughout the entire trial. <laughs> Another defendant was his son, Anthony Volpendenzo. <laughs> this guy was a kind of like the leader, the second in command of the burglary crew under. Mark Polchman, a master thief, a master burglar, same thing, home invasions in the Midwest, jewelry stores, small businesses. This guy, Anthony, his son, was also a championship BMX bicycle rider. <laughs> so what this guy would do after casing uh, jewelry stores and homes and small businesses for months, once they put the plan together, most of his MO was he would ride his bicycle to the jewelry store and stash it. He'd go in, threaten everybody with violence, never use violence, but threaten everybody with violence, smash and grab, take all the jewels, escape, and he used his bicycle to get away as the getaway car. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> One of, the, one of the ladies from the jewelry store, somehow she got, she got loose from being tied up. I think he tied her up with duct tape. Somehow she got loose, and she attempted to go after him. And she testified in court she never seen anybody ride a bicycle the way he did. <laughs> of course, he's a champion BMX rider. Those guys, they can, they can ride up and down stairs. They go down the side of a mountain if they walk back up. <laughs> now, this guy, Gary, he was he was in custody. So every day, this is right around Christmas time, every day before court started and throughout the afternoon when court would take a lunch break or a recess, there's, a, there's an air, area behind the courtroom where the prisoners are, right? Mm -hmm. So out of nowhere, you would hear somebody singing, Christmas carols out loud. <laughs> and normally they would put a kibosh. They wouldn't allow that in, a, in, a, in the Dirksen Federal Courtroom. Yeah. But yeah. this guy had such a wonderful voice <laughs> that everybody, even the judge, actually enjoyed his singing. So they kind of allowed him to, to sing Christmas carols. <laughs> which one was it? Could you oh, you name it. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Uh, I mean, which guy was it? Which defendant? Oh, I'm sorry. That was... Uh, Anthony Volpendenzo. Okay. All right. <laughs> Sam's son. I'll be darned. Okay. So now back to Mike Sarno. At this particular time, Mike Sarno had a beef with a competitor 
video gaming guy, uh, a Spanish guy. I can't pronounce his name. This particular Spanish guy was warned many times to stay out of certain restaurants, get your machines out of certain bars. This is largest territory. Stay out of it. He refused. He wasn't backing down. He wasn't scared of large or his crew. So fast forward, Mike Sarno, who was an associate of Mark Polkman, the high-ranking outlaw motorcycle gang, large set Mark Polkman and another high-ranking motorcycle gang guy, a real big, big guy, 300-pound, tattoos all over, real mean, real intimidating. They showed his picture um, on the courtroom monitor. These two motorcycle guys went into the um, Spanish guy's bar or restaurant and basically trashed the whole place, beat everybody up in their biker style <laughs> to basically send a message. Yeah, you got to get your machines out of here. This guy was not backing down. Fast forward. This Spanish guy, again, I'm forgetting his name. He actually lived in the same neighborhood as Big Mike. And at one point, they had words in the driveway. Mike Sarno warned them again. Hey, I'm telling you, last chance, you know, you better get your machines out of there. Now, this guy testified to this, how the bikers came in and other guys came in to, to try to um, intimidate him and scare him. His words with Mike Sarno, quote, F you fat ass is what he called them right to his face. That was it. That was the straw that broke the camel's back. Shortly after that, Mark Polkman, Sam Bolpenzenzo Sr., his son Anthony Bolpenzenzo Jr., and a couple other guys who turned informant, they received the bomb from Samuel, the master blaster, and they blew up his video amusement warehouse, blew it to smithereens. Oh, really? So the government, not only did they show photos of the aftermath, the damage that was done by the bomb, but they brought in charred brick, uh, furniture that was burnt, items in the, in the warehouse that were destroyed by the bomb. They actually brought that in for the jury to see. Mm. Now, I don't know what the law is now, but back then, Anything related to a bomb is automatic 25, 30 years. Yeah, man, it probably still is. And and that would have been when they brought in the ATF on this, why that ATF agent ended up when they when that bomb was used. Absolutely. Now, aside from uh Lou, the ATF agent, who, you know, a pretty tough guy, he had tattoos all over the place. He had a lot of experience doing undercover work. He wasn't intimidated by these guys. He befriended Mark Pol Polkman. Mark Polkman was very cautious and very paranoid, but he somehow he, he gained his trust and they kind of became buddies, right? They had some things in common. Now, aside from the ATF Lou, the FBI had a really, really strong uh, a case against these guys. They had two female detectives, two beautiful blonde women that were the, the lead detectives on this case. Mm -hmm. And um, be in the alley of Goldberg Jewelers, one of the FBI agents testified how they mounted a camera on a, on a pole in the alley of a Goldberg Jewelers. Um, so fast forward, Mike Sarna was very paranoid too. Very, very cautious, always, you know, always feeling somebody's watching him, always on the lookout. And one day he walked into uh, Goldberg Jewelers. They got him on tape. Mike got walked in. He had his hat on backward. And without saying anything, Mark Polkman handed him the Chicago Sun-Times. On the front story of the Chicago Sun-Times newspaper, was a story of the bombing in Berwyn. So Mike Sarno looked at it. He put it in the shredder and shredded it. Hmm. 
the FBI, uh, the government later on took the shredded newspaper, brought it into court, and actually pieced the newspaper together <laughs> really? to show the story. So they were basically showing Mike Sarno and Mark Polkman not really having a conversation about the bombing, but discussing it without discussing it. Yeah, definitely had an interest in that bombing and enough interest that they would shred. Why would you shred a newspaper, you know? Absolutely. <laughs> it um, says a lot without saying much. Now, I forgot to mention, and, and this, this was a real eye-opener for me, two of the defendants were police officers. Oh, they, right, were, right. they were part of the burglary crew. Now, they were from Cicero and Berwyn. They weren't robbing people's houses, but what they would do, Gary, let's say there was a domestic call. Mr. and Mrs. Smith got in an argument. The police would show up to take the report, but in reality, they were casing the place. Mm. So if they, if they came across a home or a business where they thought they had valuables there, they would tip off the, the outfit crew. Hey, I just came back from Gary Jenkins' house. I noticed he had a safe. He had some jewelry. So then the Mark Polkman's crew would rob that business. Mm -hmm. So the police were tipping off the outfit crew. I believe they also tipped him off on some surveillance activity around his uh, uh, business, right? Absolutely. They would they would uh, constantly let Mark Polkman know he's being he's being watched. He's under surveillance. They they didn't know a whole lot about it because the FBI took over the investigation. Yeah. But basically, the cops were providing scores for the outfit and also tipping uh, Mike Sarno and Mark Polkman um, on um, on the investigation. Now, was the uh, Chicago police, uh, did they have any detectives involved in the investigation? No, not all. that I know of. Yeah. Uh, another thing I want to mention about uh, Goldberg Jewelers is, okay, in Mark Polk, Polkman's mind, and he said this on tape, he didn't think he was doing anything wrong, meaning he was not selling drugs. Yeah. He was not involved in firearms. So to him, he didn't think, the FBI and the cops were interested in him because he wasn't selling drugs. He, he wasn't selling firearms. However, because of the sophisticated burglar ring he was running, the fencing operation, and now the bombing, now they were interested. So he, he really underestimated them because, again, in his mind, I'm not selling drugs. I'm not selling guns. I'm not really doing anything wrong. Right next to Goldberg Jewelers was a currency exchange. At one point, they blasted a hole right in the wall, went into the hole and stole, I don't remember the amount, 200 and something thousand dollars right from the currency next door. <laughs> well, now uh, the motorcycle gang aspect, did, uh, did they talk much about that? What the, the background of that and what they did not. Connection? They just they, they just talked a lot about Mark Polkman being not just a motorcycle member, but a high ranking member. And they talked about another high ranking member. I don't, I don't remember his name, but they were just showing the, the connection between that largest outfit crew and the outlaw motorcycle gang. The connection was the burglary crew and obviously the bombing. Yeah. And, and the intimidation, the, uh, on using the motorcycle gang members to intimidate competition. Somebody's in competition with the outfit. Now, did they bring in anybody to show the outfit as being an organized crime operation or a mafia operation? Did they did they get into that? Lots of times, they the did. defense lawyers are really working to keep that out. Yeah. Um, well, okay. Now back to the defense lawyers. Um, Mark Polkman was represented by a really sharp young attorney, up and coming attorney. Somebody who I know, I met him at the court buildings. His name is Damian Churros. This guy represented Rob Blagojevich. Oh, really? <laughs> and during lunch one time, I actually said to him, to the lawyer, I said, you know, no offense, but as a court ball, from my, my perspective, it just seems to me that the prosecutors, their lawyers are a lot sharper than the defense attorneys. 
<laughs> no disrespect to the defense attorneys. This is just my observation. They're more polished, less fluff, less bullshit, yeah, less yeah. smoke and mirrors. I just thought they were better lawyers. And he said, Jimmy, it's not that they're better lawyers. We're all good lawyers. They have all the evidence. <laughs> so this, this guy, Damian Churros, he represented Mark Polkman. It, it was pretty tough on him because, again, all the evidence was against Mark Polkman. Now, Mark Sarno's lawyer was a famous mob lawyer um, called Terrence Giuseppe. This guy's like the Johnny Cochran of mob lawyers. Yeah. He's represented lots of mob guys as well as um, Betty Lauren Maltese. Betty Lauren Maltese was the mayor of Cicero. She oh, stole wow. $12 million, so he represented her. So the defense lawyers were good, but they were just outmatched in this particular trial. I want to I want to mention the the judge though uh, Ron Ron Guzman. He played this trial very very smart. Prior prior to the trial, I'm not sure how, but he allowed large out on bond. Now normally a guy like Mike Sarno with his reputation, yeah. you know, convicted felon, normally those guys don't get bond. But he allowed large out on bond, right? He also granted Mike a, a special request. Prior to Christmas, Big Mike's lawyer asked if Large could go out to dinner with his family. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> the judge allowed it. Mike Sarno went out to dinner, Joe's Seafood Steakhouse, a very expensive restaurant. They had a wonderful meal. And I'll tell you why I'm bringing this up. Fast forward. All the defendants are found guilty. I don't think Mike Sarno was surprised, but his family was definitely surprised. His wife, his son, his daughter, another lady I didn't know, and a couple of his friends sat in court every day, and they were there to support Mike Sarno. To them, Mike Sarno is not a mob boss. This is their father. This is her husband. You know, this is... They, they don't think of him as, as a mob guy. So when Mike Sarno was found guilty, the wife kind of yelled out. She screamed something out. The other, the one daughter ran out of the courtroom. So now the prosecution made a motion. We want to reprehend him in custody. We want him taken into custody. Right. That's the normally the conviction. They go ahead and... You know, take your, put your hands behind your back, they handcuff them and lead them out. Now, Mike Sarno and his family were not expecting that. That kind of took them off guard. Now, keep in mind, I'm in the courtroom. I'm 15 feet away from them. So the one daughter was so upset that they were basically going to take him into custody. She yelled out something to the effect, well, it's going to be a real nice Christmas now. You know, she, she was upset, yeah. right? So now Mike Sarno, he's no stranger to going to jail, right? Yeah. He, you know, the, the lawyer's preparing for the worst. He prepared a little note. He attempted to read the note. He couldn't read the rest of the note. He broke down. So mm -hmm. here's a 300, 350 pound man. You know, they don't call him large for nothing. <laughs> crying. You know, that was. That's when it gets real, Gary. Yeah, I can imagine that would be, be part of it to see. Bottom line, they took him into custody. But the reason I brought up the judge, the judge allowed him out on bond. The judge allowed him to go out to have a fancy dinner with his family. So this time, no, bro, I gave you a break earlier. We're yeah. taking you into custody. The prosecution felt with his reputation, his criminal record, his his finances, he was a flight risk. Yeah. So unfortunately, uh, he was taken into custody. I, I, I think he got 25, 30 years. And right now he's in uh, Virginia trying to get out on a passionate, passionate release. Yeah. So what about the people that testified against him, the people that they turned? What were they like? I'm glad you asked. Um, the biggest low lowlife, biggest... Some of the biggest low-life scumbags I've ever laid out on. One of them was uh, 
two guys, Marquet and Kyle Knight, basically not members of organized crime, but burglars, mm-hmm. part of uh, Anthony Volpadenzo and Mark Poltzman burglary crew. So these guys got pinched. They decided to cooperate. The one guy wore a wire. He actually got Sam, the master blaster, the old World War II veteran. They got him talking, as I mentioned. He was complaining about large. He was referring to large as the boss. Okay. That, that, oh, yeah. See, that's important there. Yeah. And now, now some of these men, Gary, are hard to believe because they got a lot of baggage. But <laughs> they have so much detail, some jurors find them credible. This guy, like I said, he got Sam on tape bragging about the bomb that was used in the Berwyn explosion. And get this, this this one really broke my heart. The other uh, informant, Mark Hay, part of the burglary crew, a career criminal, a real low life, drug addict, you name it. They robbed a, um, a residential house. They got caught. The old man and old lady were coming home from Walmart. They caught the robbers in the act. The old lady, who's a widow now, testified how her husband, probably 76 years old, got in a fight with one of the robbers. Yeah. And he was getting the best of the burglar. He was getting the best of them. (laughs) The burglar, in order to get away from the old man, stabbed the old guy in the leg in order to break free and get away. When everyone in the courtroom heard that, the judge, the jury, the prosecutors, court buffs like myself, when we heard that this guy had a stab an old man in the leg to break free, we were appalled, disgusted. And then it got a little funny because um, the way the prosecution was asking the lady, the widow was basically saying, yeah, my husband kind of, you know. He was getting the best of this guy. (laughs) But what a scumbag to stab an old man in the leg in order to break free. And then these informants basically testified that Large was the boss of the crew. And they they said all kinds of things about Mark Polkman. And the prosecution, as you know, I don't know about New York or California, but in my opinion, the federal prosecutors in Illinois are some of the best in the country. Gary, they very, very seldom lose a case. They're well-prepared. They're professional. And um, they basically corroborate everything that these scumbag informants uh, say. And bottom line, the jury uh, found them credible. Interesting. What about the two policemen? Now, they were equal co-defendant. This was like a big racketeering. They pled guilty and agreed to cooperate. Oh, okay. So they testified, too. Yeah. And one of the one of the uh, policemen, uh, his father was a was a criminal, a mob associate. So he testified that. Several times a year, he would drive from Chicago to Florida with hundreds of thousands of cash to deliver to his father. Huh. Money from drugs, from yeah. jewel, from robberies. Um, he also testified that. One day he was uh, on a police call in somebody's house, again, on a call, but kind of case in the place. And he heard the bomb in Berwyn go off and he testified how the, even though he was a couple blocks away, how the the house shook. Well, I wonder, did uh, did everybody go into witness protection or did they even talk about that? Could could you tell? Um, I'm not sure, but. One, one of the defendants, I, I forgot to mention, I, I'm hesitant to talk about him because him and I actually became friends, drinking buddies, <laughs> years later, after the trial, after he got home. Yeah. This guy I'll refer to uh, as the Polish guy. Yeah. Uh, and was a, he a I mean, member of the burglary crew? No. This guy, uh, the Polish guy, he was out on bond. He was a, an associate of large, an associate of the outfit. He came in court every day dressed in black with a cane. Mm -hmm. Now, some of these guys, they come in with a cane in a wheelchair. It doesn't work. It it doesn't fool the jury one bit at all. There's no 
nobody feels any way if, if you come in with a cane or a, a wheelchair, right? <laughs> yeah. So this guy, um, what he was charged with was he had a very expensive Hummer. Remember the Hummers? Oh, yeah. Sure. So what he would do, he had a route seven days a week. He would go into restaurants, bars, and service the machines. So he would uh, service the machine, collect the money. So the way it works today, the owner of the bar gets a third, the company that provides the machine gets a third, and the state gets a third. Hmm. A third, a third, a third. That's legit. What Large was doing was he was giving the owner of the bar and a restaurant a cut. They were taking a cut, but they weren't paying taxes. Uh. So – this particular Polish guy, he he would go into bars and restaurants and basically service and collect machines. The defense called the owner of the bar, owner of the restaurant, say, hey, did this man ever threaten you? No, he didn't. Does this man ever do any, anything violent to you? No, he didn't. Describe his behavior. He was a gentleman, a professional. So largest crew at this time, they weren't using violence. They weren't. They weren't beating anybody up. They were providing a service. Right. And, and the owner of the bar was, was making a profit. However, it was illegal what he was doing. He ended up going to jail. He had a beautiful female attorney. I don't remember how many years he got, but he got a couple years. Yeah, he wouldn't have And uh, he's out of jail today. Yeah, yeah, he wouldn't have to do much time. Probably, probably did about 18, 16, 18 months federal time. Yeah, and probably at a you know, camp or something. So uh, interesting. Everybody gets different time depending on what they did, but they could they did the racketeering. So it could and I remember um, again because all the evidence was against Mark Polkman. Polkman. Um, how much time did he get? Do you remember? Judge that? came down hard on him. He gave him 60 years. Mark Polkman was shocked. Again, in his mind, I didn't sell any drugs. I didn't sell any guns. But he underestimated the bombing charge. Now he he did uh, file a motion to get that reduced. And I think right now it's down to 30. But originally <laughs> they gave him 60 years in prison. Man. Woo. He, did, he must have really had... Uh... They must have had him really good on that bombing charge. They must have, uh, somebody testified that he was the guy that orchestrated that whole thing. Yeah. And I forgot to mention, I, um, somebody saw the van that, that the crew used to, to bomb the place in Berwyn. He was driving that van allegedly. Okay. Oh, he, he went right to the scene with his buddies. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. He set it up and oversaw it and went by going to the scene. Yeah, Large was not there, Yeah, but Mark Holtman was there. The father and son, Volpen Denzels, were there. A couple of the informants were there. And uh, that's when the heat really came on is uh, after, that, after that bomb. But again, this, this particular Spanish guy was warned many, many times to back off. He wasn't backing off. Like I mentioned, he had words with Large. He insulted him, disrespected it. And uh, and Mike Sarno, he's no punk. He's the real deal. Yeah, yeah. You know? I gathered that. Was uh, the Spanish guy? Was he there? He was at trial, I assume. He testified against Large. How did he come across? Was he pretty believable? He he was believable, but he came across cocky and arrogant. Yeah. Now, did he have? And if I were have... him, I would have been. I would have been a little nervous on there. But no, he. Go ahead. Did he have legal ahead, machines? He did. Okay, his machines were legal. We're at Sarno. But he was paying taxes. And he was paying the taxes. Of course, that's the difference is legal and illegal machines. One, you just tell the state you get some kind of a, probably a tag and, and mark that it's, you know, you get licensed by the state and you pay taxes or you don't. And, and that's the difference. Interesting. Uh, Gary, I, I don't play these machines. I hope you don't. But it amazes no. me today as we speak. How many women, how many guys of all ages, all races play these machines for hours? Hours, I know. 
walk into any casino and check it out. And for uh, just, and a lot of the people you see playing them, they aren't people that should be wasting their money on gambling. Because yeah, yeah. <laughs> nobody you never wins. see a rich man playing these machines. No, nobody wins in the end. You may win a little bit, but it's the worst thing that ever happened to you as a new gambler go in and hit a big jackpot and make, you know, two or three thousand dollars off of, you know, 50 cents or a dollar. You're hooked. I, I know people like that. They're hooked. Now, I, I got I got to confess this particular trial. And I'm probably wrong in saying this, but I didn't think they had a I didn't think they had a whole lot of Mike Sarno. I mean, they had his reputation. Right. Yeah. They had his demeanor, the way he looks. You can't convict him on his looks. But again, they were able to tie him in as being the leader of the crew. They showed the motive of the bombing. That was clear. And they had informants testifying who he is, what his responsibilities were. And I was I was kind of rooting for large. I thought maybe they would find him not guilty. But I know better. I know um, in the Dirksen Federal Building, uh, you're going to be found guilty. Yeah, I guess what they really needed was someone like Mark Poulton to say, yeah, he told me to do this. But they didn't have that smoking gun kind of a guy, did they? Correct. Well, no, they had the the old guy, the Navy war veteran, Samuel, yeah. the master blaster. They had him on tape talking about large. Yeah. They had two of the informants talking about large, but. But they and, and I, I'm also forgetting to mention when the FBI agents, the two female agents, when they were following large in his car, he was freaking out. He would speed up. Then he would slow down. Then he would pull over. So later on in the investigation, Mike Sarno, Mark Pulpin, they knew they were being watched. Yeah. And they just didn't know how serious the indictment was until it happened. Yeah. They kind of figured the, you know, the poker machine, I, you know, as a guy told me once, he said, man, I can do a tray stand on my head. They figured the, the poker machine Okay, you know, you give me a little time. I'll go up here to the camp and and do my little bit of time and come back and and get these machines going again. They just didn't count on that bombing thing. That was stupid. That was that was really dumb on his part. Absolutely. I think if they wouldn't have bombed that place, I don't think they would have indicted Mike Sino. They no. might have indicted the other guys on on the burglary crew. Yeah, yeah. But uh, but without the bombing, they wouldn't even got into it into the burglary crew, would they? Absolutely. Uh, no, I, I agree. Well, for one of the nail, the shoe was lost and right on down to the, the, the final, uh, the end of that trail. Interesting. Well, there's a, there's a few, there's a few other things I'm forgetting. Uh, again, the prosecution, they showed photos of, of large um, meeting, socializing with other made members, clear photographs of, Mike Sarno with so and so. So hey, what are you doing with this guy here, yeah. the boss of Chinatown crew? Yeah. Yeah. What are you yeah. doing with known alpha members? And the pictures were quite obviously that Mike Sarno was was friends with these guys and actually a part of it. Yeah, that's uh, you know in uh, in the skim trials in Kansas City, they brought Ken Ito, uh, who was a Chicago guy as. Uh, mobster that they tried to kill ran a lot of gambling for him and he knew the whole makeup and they they brought him down and i brought jamie fradiano down hmm. or in to just to explain to the jury this is the mob this is the outfit for chicago this is who this is they used that picture i believe that hmm. famous picture of, i think you maybe call it the last supper uh, with, yeah. uh, with all the the leaders during those 70s and and then point out this guy and who's that guy and who's this guy and who's that guy in, in order to establish the organization. You know, government, I tell you, they uh, <laughs> you don't want them after you. I know that. <laughs> uh, and, and kudos to them. I mean, first class professionals. They yeah. do a very thorough job. They're very pro- professional. Um, lots of experience. And and as you know, Gary, from your your days as a detective, you know these investigations could be three, four, five years, they make yeah. it solid airtight before they even bring it to trial. Yeah. It's, it's almost a slam dunk. Yeah, I, I don't know how. I've had a couple, three trials as a lawyer, just little trials. 
I don't know how they keep all that in their head and keep that organized and then get the right questions. And, and, you know, they've got help who gets them the right witnesses, but, but they got to keep a lot of stuff in their head in order to be one of these. And this is not a, this is not the most complicated trial that they've ever done, of course, but, but it's an, an example, a nice little example of a racketeering trial using RICO and, and all those different predicate crimes that, that you had. You got the burglaries and the, the bombing and all that in order to bring in the racketeering charge and, and then get the boss, take down a whole segment of an organization. That's, that's a good example of it. That's, it's kind of understandable the way you, you've explained it, especially. All right, James. Well, this has been great. Uh, good show. What, what are we going to do next time? A little teaser for the folks after this one. What, what do you want to do next? Well, next next one, I, I would like to talk about the Bobby Salerno trial. Okay. All right. We'll do that. Bobby Salerno, real quick. Yeah. Tell, was yeah give us an overview of that because yeah. I'm not sure myself. Bobby Salerno, a, a boxer, a real tough guy, uh, a heavyweight in the Chicago outfit. He was part of the um, Rocky Infelice crew. Okay. And the, the, the first trial, the lollipop trial, Rocky and his crew all, all got found guilty. One of the defendants, the guy they referred to as the man in, the, man in black, Bobby Slerno, the jury hung on him. Mm. I'll not. Now I didn't. I did not go to the uh, lollipop trial. I missed that, but I followed it. But I do remember seeing Bobby Salerno on TV on the news coming out court. He was ecstatic that the jury yeah, hung on him. Yeah. Not, not not guilty, but they hung on him. Right. He was ecstatic. However, as you know, the government's going to try it again. Yeah. Oh yeah. And. They're not going to lose a second time. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> so now this trial, the trial I went to was the USA versus Bobby Salerno. It was about, they killed the bookie, not just any bookie, the largest bookie in the United States. When I say the largest bookie in the United States, I mean the number one bookie in the United States. I don't remember the money this guy was bringing in. You would not believe the money. Millions and millions of dollars. This bookie was already paying the outfit money every month on time, like clockwork. Really? Well, they, they found out how much money he was really making. They wanted more. He was like, are you kidding me? How greedy can you be? I've, I've already been paying you guys. I've never missed one payment. Now you want more money? I'm not paying you. So same thing. They warned them. They warned them many times. He even ran into a guy in a famous restaurant on Grand Avenue called the Como Inn. They had words. He basically told them, F you, I'm not paying you. And everybody knows this. This is a famous quote. The outfit guy said, you, my friend, are trunk music. Make a long story short. They used another bookie, another big time bookie. He was friends with Hal Smith. They had B.J. Jehoda, one of their bookies, yeah. lure Hal Smith to the house. At the house, Rocky and his crew, they all had on golf clubs. They killed Hal Smith. Allegedly, one of the men, according to B.J. Jehoda, was Bobby Salerno. Yeah. So they got him for murdering a bookie. But what I loved about the Bobby Salerno trial his son represented him in court. Oh, wow. <laughs> this guy, bad. and we'll talk about, I don't want to get into it now, but yeah, that's this, interesting. by the way, this mob guy was out on bond. Yeah, how was he? Same thing. He could come and go. You could talk. You can make small talk. I actually met him. Him and I had a nice little conversation that I'll share with you on the next show. Cool. But this guy, now this guy's an old guy at the time, 70 something years yeah. old. He was so proud that his son <laughs> represented him yeah. in court. I was a lawyer. We'll talk yeah. about that. <laughs> but you can research it, Bobby Salerno. It's I a great that. story. All right, James. I really appreciate you coming on the show. It's, uh, people, Thanks I so know, much. I know people Jerry. out there like it. All my Chicago fans particularly just love your description of these trials.
and I'm a big fan of yours, Gary. Thank and you. um, and I I definitely want to buy you a cup of coffee. <laughs> All right. But, Gary, I want to do it in person when I'm in Kansas City. <laughs> okay, dude. You let me know you're coming to Kansas City. When I went to Chicago, I should have got a hold of you, but I had kind of a whirlwind trip up there. Yeah, I would I would love to give you a tour, a real tour. All right. All right. I, I'll I'm gonna hold you to that. I'm gonna I'm gonna come back up there. All right, Thanks, folks. Gary. Folks, uh, I, I really appreciate y'all tuning in and don't forget watch out for motorcycles when you're out there. As I took the motorcycles up to uh, Chicago before. That's a hard town to ride a motorcycle in, though. <laughs> that traffic, oh, and the distances, God, just wore me out. That and I had where I was staying. I had to go through a very dicey neighborhood and, and oh, you know, driving a dicey neighborhood in a car is one thing, driving it on a motorcycle and getting stopped at a light is another. <laughs> so uh, now you had your female friend on the back of the bike. Or did yeah, she, no, she had her, her own bike. bike. She had her okay. own bike. She was really nervous. So I know she was, she was a retired cop too, but she was, oh, she nervous. Is. Yeah, yeah, she was nervous. She got kind of an early retirement. She got injured somehow. Anyhow, uh, don't forget, if you have any problems with PTSD and if you've got a relative or a friend or something, make sure that they get a hold of the VA and, and get that hotline and, and get some help for that PTSD because there's help available. So thanks a lot, folks. Thanks a lot, James. Thank you. See you. All right.